So, as you know, we are in Pilgrim's Progress now, and we did have questions that you had posted in the general communication. Did everybody see those? Anybody not know that there were questions? Okay. Keep your eye out because uh, they're going to get posted in that Slack channel, general communication. When they do get posted, there's a lot of activity in that channel, so sometimes it can rise up and kind of disappear. So you'll need to grab it as soon as it comes out. These are not the questions at the end of the book. So like if you were to go to the back of the book, there's some more questions there. Uh, these are questions that Pastor Dale or I will be creating. And uh, hopefully they'll get us more into the, the meaning of Bunyan. Okay. So this chapter, chapter one, is Christian flees from the city of destruction. And then we also see the introduction of obstinate and pliable. So he's fleeing the city of destruction, and we are introduced to obstinate and pliable. And now let's talk a little more specifically about the setting, in case there's some that haven't read this before, or uh, some who haven't read it uh, recently. So what's the main setting What's going on in this introduction or this first chapter? Um, who are the characters? We'll start there. Who are the characters? I already said obstinate and pliable, but what are some of the other characters? Sixto. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You have Christian. You have his wife. You have his sons. You have the people from the town that come in. Uh, yep. when he's coming to the decision to leave that are trying to talk him out of it. And apart from the two that you mentioned, um, there's evangelists that he meets later on. Yeah, we're going to see evangelists. Anybody, did I miss anybody? Obstinate, pliable? These are uh, 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 the characters of chapter one. And what is the setting? What is the setting? The context that we're in right now. Mitchell, in the middle. The author is describing a dream he's having. Yeah, if you look at uh, the first page of the chapter, if you have your books, he says, As I was walking through the wilderness of this world, I came to a place where there was a cave. I laid down in that place to sleep, and as I slept, I had a dream in which I saw a man dressed in rags. So the author is using the first person pronoun. I was walking through the wilderness of this world. So uh, the character there that he's created is having a dream. And as he's having a dream, the dream is of a man dressed in rags. So essentially, this whole account of Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress, is a dream. It's a... Uh, it cues us in very clearly that it's an allegory. Uh, so Bunyan's going to use this story of this man whom, of whom he has a dream of to uh, teach the Christian life. So that's the setting. Now, what's the setting in the dream? Not the setting of the man that's, that's in the wilderness of this world and falls asleep in a cave. And then, he, and then he dreams of this man with the rags. But what's the setting of the dream? We got the, the man with the rags, but what's the location of the dream? Christian is living in the city of destruction. 
And he goes from there to where Evangelist says is a wicked gate. Yeah. So the setting is the city of destruction. And you can see that, he says in that same first page, second paragraph, middle of that paragraph, he says, and what's worse, I've been reliably informed that our city will be burned with fire from heaven. So it's the city that will be destroyed. Okay. Anything else about this setting that occurs in chapter 1? There's more there. He's not just a man that's in rags, dwelling in a city of destruction. But what are some other things about the context? Um, I see that he, he went home. You know, so I see a lot happening with his, his household. Yep. So he has, we have a, a more... Uh, specific uh, place to consider the home uh, Joby already mentioned it but he's if you will rem- uh, right here Dr. Carl did you have one question or uh, po- uh, there's statement. an important aspect is there is a way of, a, of escape yeah, there is a, a deliverance So he's informed there's a way of escape from this city of destruction. Any more about the setting? We're first introduced to Christian with a evident conflict. Like he's already burdened and laid, you know, laid down. He's weeping and crying. So uh, as soon as we're introduced to him, there's already, you know, some kind of issue, uh, yep. particularly evident in him. I would say it, uh, we're going we're gonna to get to what occurs in this setting, but I'm trying to think about, like, uh, good, that's a very good point. So maybe we ought to transition. Is there anything else about the, we got the characters of, of the allegory started now in his dream. We've got the setting. Anything else? There's a place. There's more to the setting. Go ahead. So he does mention that there are fields that he's walking through. and Yeah, fields. And that it appears to be the... He's walking through them as if someone who doesn't know which way to run. Yeah, so he's kind of uh, a little aimless in his plight. Uh, what is evangelist? Is there anything that evangelist says that helps us with the setting? Think about the landscape of this dream. You have the city of destruction. You have the home with the family. You have the fields. Of course, we haven't got to the plot. But Evangelist points off another location in the setting. Where does Evangelist point? I saw a hand. To the wicked gate. Yes. Wicked. Not wicked. And if I look up wicked, because you might hear that again, it means a small door or gate, especially one set in or near a large door or gate. So if you think about a very big gate, big door, and then off to the side of that is a very little gate. What does that remind you of? Matthew 7. That's right. The broad way and the narrow way. And evangelist doesn't say, you see that big gate? He says, you see that little gate? He says, I can't see it. Then what does he say? Look for the light. He just, so there's a light in this dream that evangelist is wandering. Now he has some direction. And evangelist is saying... You might not see the gate, but look at the light and go in that direction. 
Okay, so that's the characters, the setting, the plot. I know that right now what we're describing is the allegory. Uh, We haven't actually got to the truths represented by the allegory. What is the plot? What's the first thing that we're introduced to with the plot? What's his first question, or Brother Tom? I was going to speak to something else. I was going to say that he's wandering in the field. He's got a huge burden on his back. Mm. Yes. That's, that's worthy of the setting. Burden, huge burden on his back. Book. Book. That's right. I'm going to run out of space. I'm just going to add to. So he has the burden. He has a book. These are items. These are locations. These are non-characters, but everything else that makes up the story. We haven't got really to the plot. And I think that, um, I think it was Mitchell was talking about the rags. Or I can't remember. Uh, in, in the book, Burden, Rags, anything else? Sixto? Uh, what it brings to mind is uh, John fourteen six, where Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one yeah. comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, amen, amen. And I want to get there. We're, gonna, we're really going to draw out what this, so we have, in, y'all remember an allegory. An allegory is... Uh, let me see if I can give a good t- uh, dictionary definition. A story in which people, things, and happenings have a symbolic meaning. And allegories are used for teaching and explaining truths, principles, or ideas. So right now, what, we're, what I'm focusing, focusing on is the story... And then when we get to the questions, we're going to get to the truths. So this story Bunyan is using to teach truths. And right now, I just want to make sure everybody understands the story. So the plot. In the story, what's happening? He says, what shall I do? So he's dressed in rags. He has a big burden on his back. He's got the book in his hand, and he says, trembling and weeping, unable to contain himself any longer, what shall I do? And he went home in this great distress. He could no longer stand it, and he talked to his family. He says, oh, my dear wife and children, I'm suffering from inner turmoil because of the burden that lays heavily upon me. And what's worse, I've been reliably informed that our city will be burned with fire from heaven. In that fearful disaster, I with you, my wife, and you, my sweet children, will come to a miserable ruin unless we find some way of escape, which as yet I do not see may be found by which we may be delivered. Okay, so right after he says this to his family, his family, if you'll remember, does not respond like he does. They thought that they might be able to drive him away from his insanity. This guy is insane. So... They began to be hardened by his words and they tried to drive him away by his insanity and they tried to use harsh speech, bad-tempered behavior towards him. They're trying to drive him out of it. Stop thinking like that. And then sometimes they would make fun of him. Other times they would criticize him. Other times they would just simply ignore him. 
And because of this, he began to withdraw from them to his bedroom to pray for them, pity them, and comfort his own misery. And that then he would walk in the fields as well. It's not until he's walking in the fields does he run across a man named Evangelist. And Evangelist starts off the whole inter- encounter with questions. Why, why are you crying? I realize I'm going to die. We're going to be judged. Why aren't, why aren't you willing to die? It makes you think like, Okay, well, why, why don't you want to die? Because there's other people that do. He's getting them to draw out his, his, uh, his burdens. He says, because I fear this burden on my back will make me sink lower than the grave and I'll fall into hell. So he recognizes he's going to go to hell. And then he asks him, if this is your condition, why are you standing here? He's just dialoguing with him. And then he says, because I don't know where to go. So that's when evangelist has now led him to the point of telling him the good news. There's hope for you. You see that wicked gate? Go through that. I can't see it. Follow the light. And then he's called here. He's not yet called Christian. He's just called a man. And Horner says that at the end, more towards a, a latter chapter, his, his name before he became Christian was called Graceless. So really, who he is right now is Graceless. So Evangelist says, go to the wicked gate. He says, I can't see it. He says, follow the light. He starts going that way, and here come two people to deter him. He's acting crazy. Go get him. And who are those two people? Obstinate and pliable. If you will remember what the word, the word itself, obstinate, means, unreasonably determined to have one's own way. I mean, I don't care about reason. I don't care about logic. I'm unreasonably about things. I'm unreasonable, and I want to have my way. That's that's the name this guy has. (laughs) It's his name. I love how uh, Bunyan does that. He gives uh, adjectives as people's names. The other guy is pliable. And what does pliable mean? Let me read that to you. Easily bent or molded, flexible. A person who is easily influenced or tractable. Okay. These are the two people. So we got one guy that's wanting to go get uh, graceless, a man who's fleeing the city of destruction on his way to the shining light. And we got one guy that's easily influenced and we got one guy that's unreasonably selfish or like intractable. Okay, that's the, that's the setting, the characters and the plot. Now, let's go to our questions. Oh, I raced. Okay, so our first question was, In the first phase of the book, which says, As I walk through the wilderness of this world, Bunyan alludes to the wilderness wanderings of Israel. How does this allusion reveal Bunyan's view and the Bibles of life on this side of heaven? So, what is... This account with this man in this dream, well, I think it's before the dream, but you could even relate the fields because it's saying, as I was walking through the wilderness of the world, then the guy has a dream. But what, what is the wilderness of this world symbolic of? Um, <clears throat> for me, it would be uh, a walk uh, before we're saved. 
how um, we're wandering, trying to find the answers for ourselves, thinking that uh, we could do it for ourselves. You know, we put up our own idols until uh, the Lord gives us the, the faith to trust and believe in Christ. And kind of similar what happened with Israel because they, uh, after they disobeyed God, they wandered for 40 years until they came to the promised land. So it's kind of like what we go through before uh, we turn to Christ. Yeah. Uh, you could go, we could go, if you look at Psalm 78. Verse 40. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. There's, uh, look at Psalm 78, verse 52. But he made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. There's, this is, you know, the question's open-ended. You can take it different ways. You can, you can use wilderness uh, to describe this world uh, remember this is a location or a setting or a context it's not necessarily a state so you have in this world, there are unbelievers and there are believers. And Revelation calls unbelievers earth dwellers. So they're at home here in the wilderness, so to speak, but believers are not. So when I'm looking at Psalm 78, um, it's referencing God's people with Israel. And we know that the wilderness was not their home. They were traveling through it. God delivered them out of Egypt. And then passing through the Red Sea, they were to go into the promised land. Of course, they sinned, so they wandered long. But that wilderness was not the promised land. It wasn't their home. So they had a pilgrimage. Um... So I think there's a little bit of disconnect there with his story and the wilderness wanderings of Israel or the, our wilderness wanderings in this life because in the story, um, it's not clear who the guy is. That's, I was walking through the wilderness of this world and I had a dream. Is that person who's saying, I, a believer or an unbeliever? But either way, you could make the connection here that wilderness is a reference to the world. And then our relationship to that world is dependent on whether or not we're believers or unbelievers. And for a Christian, city of destruction, or the man, graceless, city of destruction is of this world and he's going to flee from it to salvation. But uh, there is that, it just if you want to think about wilderness with believers though, you have two peoples of God in the Bible. You have Israel and you have the church. People of God. You have Israel and that's his ethnic. And you have... I'll call it true Israel from Romans 9. Which this is by the Spirit. True Israel is made up of ethnic Jews and Gentiles. Israel is made up of ethnic Jews. Of course, there were people who were brought in like... Uh, as God fears and things like that into to the worship of Israel, but uh, this is made up of the bloodline of Abraham, whereas this is made up of those who are born of God, whether Jew or Gentile. And this is a type 
of the true Israel, which is the anti-type. And that language is picked up in like Peter. You know, if you go to First Peter, First Peter one. He's Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims or the sojourners, the wanderers. People who, when you're a pilgrim, you're not in your land, you're passing through a land. Of the dispersion, the scattered, temporary residents. So uh, that's a good way to think of a wilderness as a, a place where you're temporarily residing. We are pilgrims. And if you remember the transfiguration on the mount, Moses and Elijah were discussing what with the Lord? His exodus. So, Jesus is the Passover lamb for this true Israel. And they were discussing his cross work which would be the Passover lamb for his people, his exodus. So there's a new exodus. There's an exodus that they, uh, the type represented. It represents the new exodus, which is in the Passover lamb, in whom we're delivered not from Egypt. What are we delivered from? The bondage of what? Sin. Okay, so I'll, I'm not going to keep going on that. Because I want, there's so many other truths in here. Uh, let's go to the next question. Considering footnotes two through six, which is at the end of the chapter, how do the truths of these verses woven into the details of the man's attire, posture, book, burden, as well as his attitude make this story about every Christian? Okay, so let's think about the, the happenings and attributes of this man of that's being uh, delivered from the city of destruction. First of all, his rags. What does that communicate? What is that representing? That's true of every Christian at their, you know, leading up to their conversion, or even, even now, like our, you know, what, what is it representing? Their uh, spiritual bankruptcy? Yeah, our righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that we don't actually do righteous works as believers by the power of the Spirit and in faith in Jesus Christ, and that we're definitively sanctified when we're born again. I'm not denying those truths, but... At the end of the day, we're unprofitable servants. And uh, what is pleasing unto the Lord is actually the fruit of his own grace. You know. So let's look at his rags, though. Turn to Isaiah 64, 6. says, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. So Bunyan's considering the doctrine of total depravity, and from this verse, or verses like it, he has pictured a man that sees his filthy rags in the dream. And that's what they represent. So there's your allegorical connection between the dream and reality. Uh, that's his rags. Now, what about his posture? And when we say posture, we're considering um, his disposition, the direction he's going. Is he... Happy? Content? Is he faced toward the city of destruction? Away from it? His posture? His attitude? 
that he, he, what, if you look at Luke 14, 33, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. So he has a posture of forsaking. He is forsaking. He's not trying to hold on to the city. He's not trying to hold on to things. He's forsaking them. Uh, now, is it true that all Christians, before they're converted, we'll start there because that's the context, that their righteousnesses are filthy rags? Yes. How do we know that? We read that verse, right? We could go on and on about total depravity. So, Bunyan's allegorical picture of a Christian at this stage in his pilgrimage is true for everyone. You should see yourself in that text and say, that's like me. I was of filthy rags and had nothing. Um, His willingness to forsake all And his discomfort with this world and his agony and sorrow in his soul. Is that true of Christians? Is it true of all Christians throughout history? Nobody's saying yes. Yes, it's true. I know that it comes in different degrees and it looks in different ways in expression. But the Holy Spirit, let's look at Ezekiel 36. Uh, I'm going to look at just 31. It, uh, just glance at 25. I will sprinkle. 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. 27, I'll put my spirit in you, cause you to keep my judgments. 29, I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. And then look at 31. So I'm, I'm, I'm reminding you that because this is the new covenant promise of salvation. That when the Holy Spirit comes to regenerate a man, they experience these truths. Their heart is radically changed. They are cleansed. But another thing is true. Then you, verse 31, then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. There's some forms of Christianity and, and that can be very fixed and dogmatic about it, and there's others that are just not well informed and they haven't yet come to a better understanding of Scripture, and they're trying to think about it in the Christian life, about, brethren, it's good to recognize that we're not good and that we were once enemies of God and estranged from God and not just know that at our conversion, but know that today. Look at Colossians. Uh, Chapter 1. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, glorious truth. And you, 
Colossians, you believers who were once alienated and enemies of God in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. It is not ungodly or somehow masochistic to remember that you were once an enemy of God and an alien of God and now have been reconciled through the blood of his cross. Revelation, we're going to sing to the lamb who was slain. We have the joy of knowing that we've been redeemed from what we once were. He who loves much has been forgiven much. To forget what you have been forgiven is to undermine the love, the, the, inform, the, the informed mind that you have been loved. Because when you fail to see God's forgiveness, you fail to understand his love toward you. When you fail to understand his love toward you, you fail to love others as you ought. So we need to remember the nature of God and our nature of our sin, not just in the volume of them, but the quality. It's against Almighty God. And he has reconciled us by the blood of his son. So in the remembrance of, wow, the Lord has forgiven me of so much. I once was an enemy and separated from him, and now he has redeemed me. That's not evil. That's not going to do you harm in the Christian life. Okay. The man has a, a knowledge of his burden. He has a growing consciousness of his sin. This is before he's converted. So uh, you imagine this big old burden on his back. You've probably seen some of the movies and drawings and things like that. Is that true of every Christian? What does the burden represent? It represents our sin. Why doesn't, does everybody have sin? How come not everybody has a burden? What is, what, there's more than just sin, Brother Tom. The knowledge and consciousness of that sin. Amen. The burden is someone's personal, like he said, conscious awareness of their sin before God. Not, not in misery, like worldly sorrow. Oh, I've destroyed this relationship. Those are good. You ought to have those, those miseries. But those are secondary. The primary misery or burden is the consciousness that you have offended God. You have sinned against Him. That should be the big burden that you want relieved. I want my conscience cleansed, but I cannot remove this burden what hope is there for me that's true of every Christian if you've not ever had a conscious awareness of your sin against God then you have biblical certain infallible warrant to question whether or not you're a Christian So, let's look at uh, the book. What is the book? We already said that once. What's the book in his hand that's informing him of his destruction? What, what's agitating? It's like, as he reads this book, this burden just gets bigger. What's the book that's doing this? Amen. Amen. I guess I sh that was too easy. Yeah, so remember that the Bible is inerrant. Um, men can lie to you. Your heart can lie to you and the devil. But God does not lie. And his word is true. You, you can put all of yourself into it. And it will never fail you. It's infallible. Uh, 
And uh, God is no respecter of persons. So this is his word for our good, but for his glory. Okay. Next question. I know we're getting close. Christian's tender regard for his family is met with contemptuous opposition. While the book gives no biblical references to this section, which ones come to mind about how he should respond to them? And how does he? So when someone becomes a Christian, and or uh, maybe before that, they're coming under a sense of their guilt. They're coming under a sense of the terrors of offending God and being his enemy. And they have no rest in their soul being convicted of their sin with a growing guilty conscience and a burden which they cannot relieve, as they begin to live in light of that truth and communicate that helplessly to others, helpless in that they can't remove it, but helpless in that they can't help but talk about it, uh, when others respond with, you're insane. Let's make fun of him. So he'll stop acting so foolish. Uh, let's ignore him. It's just, man, quit talking about that. How should we respond to that? Uh, I don't know if it's just the right answer, but for me it would be uh, to treat them with love, uh, have that zeal to share with them what I know, what, what he knows, he's telling what's going to happen. Um, then at the end, you know, it's like when you're, you're sharing the gospel or you're sharing people, first, uh, primarily their depravity, uh, they have to see for themselves according to what he's sharing uh, with them. And if they can't see that, then they can't go on the, on the trip with him because that's going to lead them to the gospel. And that, that's what I would I would do love yeah share with them what I do know and then the decision has to be theirs yeah you warn others you got to warn others that's what he does they won't handle they won't take it anymore so he retreats he pities them and prays for them and this is the, an allegory this is an allegory so there's going to be events like the burden being removed, going through the wicked gate, having conviction of his guilt now and fleeing. You know, there's a sequence of events because it's an allegory. Some of these things in reality, in Christian life, happen simultaneously. So we need to be careful that we don't think that this is the and time that we have to sequentially face these things exactly like we're seeing. Uh, so even though right now in this story we're at the point where he's just guilty and convicted of his sin and sorrowful, uh, we can think about other texts that talk about how we ought to respond to those who are not being saved. Um, and that's a good one. Prayer, warning, uh, saying, look at this book. You know, and of course, as we learn the gospel, preach the gospel. Okay. Uh, just to summarize the rest, the narrow gate uh, is what evangelists pointed him to. And we know that the narrow gate is the true way of salvation, which is faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said that, as Sixto mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through him. John 6, 65, he was very clear. No one comes to the Father but through me. Uh, and this is true for all Christians. It's called solus Christus. Catholicism says, no, it's not him alone. 
It's him and you. Easy believism says, uh, they'll attempt to say it's him, but they won't actually go through that gate. They'll say, him, 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 and they'll go right through the big old gate with an improper response to him. So we must go through the wicked gate, the narrow gate, which is Christ, and we must respond to him in repentant faith, turning from our sins to trust in Christ, following him alone. He is our salvation. It's by his atonement that we're forgiven, not by any sorrow or any kind of uh, conviction of spirit. It's by his righteousness that we're justified, not by any so-called righteousnesses of our own, whether in thought, word, or deed. It has, it's of him. It doesn't mean that we won't live a Christian life by the power of his salvation, we will. We will manifest the fruit just as certain as he resurrected from the grave. It is as certain that we will live a holy life because it's the same spirit that resurrected the son is the same spirit that gives us new life and by whom we walk in faith. But this walk is not a meritorious walk. It's the fruit of the one who did merit it, which is the son. And all must go through that narrow gate. And it will crush you. The narrow gate will humble you to the dust. And you will turn to God alone and glory in Him alone. And I'll, I'll end it there. But um, look for the second chapter's questions. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your son, our salvation. Thank you for this allegory and the truths that we were able to discuss tonight with your word. Thank you for giving us minds to understand it, condescending in your scripture to write words that we might understand. I thank you and praise you that you have given us an illuminated mind, one that can understand things that come from you. I praise you, Lord, for our salvation. I thank you for revealing the burden by giving us an awareness of our own sin. I thank you, Lord, for directing us to the cross, to your son, the wicked gate. Uh, help us now to uh, uh, walk uh, as those who have been born again and to uh, please you in your sight by faith. Amen. Amen.